Chapter 19 Believers Don't be stupid, one of the men said, squinting over his rifle. Lindsay looked at Sabrina, who had stopped in the middle of reaching for her blaster. Keep your hands way up. I'll only say it once. Sabrina reluctantly raised her hands over her head. The men were dressed in threadbare work pants and shirts, the sleeves removed for the sake of comfort. Their torsos and limbs were wrapped in belts and straps that held sheaths, holsters, and bullets. The distances they had crossed showed in the cracks in their boots and the dust in the creases of their skin. The largest man had three long knives strapped to his chest, in addition to the gun he aimed. His head nearly touched the ceiling. His shoulders were the height of the top of the door frame. The man in the middle wore glasses. He was smaller than the others, and Sabrina imagined him an easy target if she had to resort to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. The third man, not as tall as the first, was thick and wide. He wore a beard that reached his chest. His full-sized rifle seemed like a small toy in his scarred hands. Strapped to his thigh was a hatchet that Sabrina knew would be just as dangerous as a gun in close quarters. The turbines closed again, circling the cul-de-sac. The rafters and the floorboards vibrated, and the door they had entered shook in its frame. Give it another distraction, a fourth man said, appearing from another doorway. He was older than the rest, with thick silver hair that rolled in waves over a dark brown scalp. The man in the middle, his eyes obscured by the glare of light on his glasses, removed a small black palm tablet from his vest and began tapping and sliding his fingers across its screen in swift strokes. After one final decisive strike, he looked up to the ceiling as if he could see the Elved circling through it. He was different from the others. While they were somber, he wore a mischievous smile. It was clear he was enjoying himself. A second explosion sounded and the house rocked on its foundation. It was followed by a third, this one more distant. The Elved banked, accelerated, and was gone, receding in the direction of the noise. He'll stay busy trying to figure out where those came from, said Glasses as he replaced his palm screen. Lindsay and Sabrina waited in the silence that followed. The men appraised them. Sabrina could only imagine what a sight they were. Her ministry patrol suit, Lindsay's ill-fitting clothes, a belt made of rotted curtains, wild locks, and a bedraggled beach bag. Who are you and what are you doing here? Silverhair asked. I am Lindsay Medina of the Fortinbras Circle. This is my friend Sabrina Sabria. We're seeking refuge among the escaped believers. Not so much escaped as in Harden, the man with the knives said. We're all penned in by the walls. Silverhair silenced him with a glare. Your friend wears a suit we don't like to see. She is a cadet. She can speak for herself, can't she? I can. Are you a believer? Sabrina felt Lindsay's eyes on her. There was no use lying. No. The men readjusted as they absorbed this information. Silverhair motioned with his chin, and the younger man in glasses knelt down in front of Sabrina. He had a handsome, rakish face that would have fit well in one of the clubs where they used to go to dance and flirt with boys. Sabrina wondered if she had seen him in a club before. There was something familiar about him. Don't try anything, cadet. He said, a blade of grass he was chewing on bouncing on his lips. First, he removed her blaster. He checked all her pockets, probing thoroughly, his touch light and restrained when it neared her breasts and thighs. He hummed as he studied the suit and mumbled under his breath. New model, eh? Sabrina nodded, surprised. He settled his attention on her belt buckle before tapping and removing the power source, as if he had done so a million times before. Next, he asked for her arm and in a few deft motions removed the grapple. He checked the visor last, his finger rubbing the stub where she had broken off the antenna. She's not traceable. At least not by conventional means. He said, stepping back to examine the grapple. Sabrina eyed it as if he had just removed one of her limbs. With the power source gone, she was just wearing a heavy, very flexible bodysuit. How many days have you been out? This is our third... Lindsay answered. No signs of the rage? The what? Lindsay asked. Increased anger, aggression, said the young man in glasses who had examined Sabrina's suit. 
Intense nightmares? We've both had dreams, Lindsay said, looking at Sabrina. But nothing unusual. Sprocket, examine them, Silverhair said. The men had their rifles up to their shoulders again. Sprocket, as the one in the glasses was called, checked their pulses, respiration rates, even pulled down on their lids to examine the flesh around their eyes. He pronounced them safe, but the guns were not lowered. If you had been properly vetted and prepared to find us, the elders in the circle would have informed you of the rage, Silverhair said, his hand now resting on the handle of the pistol on his hip. The circle is gone, Lindsay explained. They captured everyone. Two Elveds invaded a service. No one escaped. Sabrina broke into the detention facility to save me. Sabrina was grateful that Lindsay did not mention her role in rounding up the circle. We had to flee in a hurry. There was no preparation. For a moment, the men lost their rigid composure and began asking after friends and family, rattling off names, some which Lindsay knew. She quickly answered if they had been in the service or not, or if she did not know at all. Silverhair brought them back to order. He had a powerful presence, and although not as tall as the giant with the knives strapped to him, or as muscular as the man with the scarred hands, he stood amid them like a captain on the deck of his ship. There is nothing we can do now but pray, he said, the blatant cult speak making Sabrina's skin crawl. Lindsay apologized for bringing such bad news, but by the shock of loss, her knowledge of the other circle members, or her natural charm, the three closest men had softened. Scarred hands, who had said nothing, spoke up in a voice that was surprisingly high and gentle. We are grateful you survived to be with us. We are. Silverhair repeated, the firmness in his voice unbroken. But that does not solve the problem of having an unbeliever in our midst. Sabrina lifted her chin, determined to show no fear as she waited for him to continue. Where do your allegiances lie? He asked. With her, Sabrina said, nodding to Lindsay. How could you serve the Ministry while knowing your best friend was a believer? I didn't. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Lindsay bow her head, the motion not unnoticed by Silverhair. I didn't know until she was captured. Then she told me to go see what happened to prisoners. Did you? Yes. I saw it. And? And I could not let it happen to her. Silverhair nodded. You are a foreigner among us, but you are welcome. You will find us more accepting than your masters within the Ministry. We strive to be so, because at the core of our beliefs is love. You don't need to believe in all that we do, but clearly you believe in friendship and, I would venture, love. So if you love your friend and want to protect her, you will extend that protection to us. I will protect my friend, Sabrina said cautiously. Silverhair smiled, the limitations of Sabrina's promise all too obvious. No, that is not what I ask. I only ask this. Love her. That I already do. His hand left the handle of his pistol, and he extended it to her. Then we are safe. His hand was calloused, but warm his smile wide and strikingly sincere. You can call me Grange. A fifth man lay unconscious in the front room. He was dressed like the others except that his holsters had been removed and placed on the floor in the corner. His body was long, his feet extending past the end of the sleeping mat beneath him. His thinning hair was dark and plastered against his flushed skin. Next to him rested a series of bowls holding water, moist cloths, tea, and finely mashed porridge. Grange explained that the man's name was Wills. A scorpion had stung him while they were on patrol, and they had been waiting while he recovered. Lindsay offered to help, mentioning that she was trained in first aid, and, from her efforts to learn which plants made the best dyes, had picked up some knowledge of which had healing properties as well. Grange showed her a poultice he had made from milkweed in the garden. Lindsay praised his efforts and offered to make more adding horse mint and barberry nut, which she had seen growing outside. Grange agreed. Sprocket accompanied Lindsay outside. Sabrina remained inside while the two other men played a board game on a piece of wood, with a grid incised into it. 
Stones from the garden were their improvised game pieces. The house still contained the previous occupant's possessions. Sabrina noticed one interior room was impossible to enter, filled as it was with furniture, lamps, and other random household items. But the believers preferred the safe house to be austere and efficient. Grange had explained that they were part of a scouting contingent whose job was to monitor Elved patrols. They were a militarized branch of the believers, and Sabrina recognized the need for order and the avoidance of luxuries, lest they become too used to them and unused to the hardships that came with duty. Bran was the bearded man with the scarred hands, who, with his broad back and short stature, reminded Sabrina of a bear standing on two legs. When the game was over, he entertained himself by unfolding half a dozen soiled pages from one of his pockets and reading them intensely, whispering some words to himself, his fingers moving to an unheard beat. His face was placid and calm. Denalis, the giant with the knives strapped to his body, was Bran's opposite. He cursed, spat, and stomped, throwing one of the playing pieces into the corner where it ricocheted and clattered. I'll poison your food, I will! Denalis insisted, leaning across the board. Bran was unperturbed. That might actually improve the taste, he said softly, not taking his eyes from the sheets. Denalis sulked into the kitchen. At least I have decent tools to work with, he said over the sound of drawers and cupboards opening and closing. So not all conveniences were frowned upon, Sabrina noted with a smile, hoping they would at least eat well that night. They did. Although the rations of flat bread were hard and dry, Denalis prepared warm sauces from tomatoes, mint, and olives, with the perfect balance of spices. Lindsay licked her fingers and gushed. Oh, Denalis, this is amazing! Where did you learn to cook? Home, he said before stuffing more flat bread into his mouth. Is that Fortinbras or Lysander? Lysander, he said. Sabrina and I both applied to Lysander Academy, and we were both excited to live in a new city. Right, Sabrina? Sure, Sabrina offered. Denalis stood up with a grunt and walked into the kitchen for seconds. My father taught there, he said over his shoulder. Oh, really? What did he teach? Lindsay said, brightening. I hated my father. Oh, Lindsay said, biting her bottom lip with her teeth. Bran stood up for seconds as well. Sprocket leaned in close to the women. Don't mind them. They're just worried about Wills. He'll pull through. Let the master be willing. Grange said from where he sat, cross-legged on a faded carpet. May he be willing. Lindsay quickly replied in what Sabrina guessed was proper cult speak. After dinner, Sabrina and Lindsay were given their own room. When Sabrina removed her suit, the stink was unbearable. Lindsay allowed her to use the bathtub first, their host providing buckets of well water. Sabrina's skin did not look like her own. Her skin carried impressions of the suit's mesh cross-hatching, and she bore black and purple bruises left by Pitt. In the mirror, she discovered gashes and scratches on her scalp, neck, and back. Her torso was still sensitive where the Elved had shocked her. Sabrina had no other clothes. So, once she finished her bath, she put the suit back on. When she came out of the bathroom, Lindsay was already asleep on her mat. Though the men had appeared to take Sabrina and Lindsay at their word, Sabrina still did not trust them. She rolled some blankets into a shape that in the dark she hoped they would take for her, set them on her sleeping mat, then settled herself up against the wall behind the door, determined to stand watch as long as she could before she roused Lindsay to take her place. A bang on the door woke her. For a moment she struggled to remember where she was. She was not sure how long she had slept. Any sleep had been too long. It was still pitch black outside, but she could tell that the blankets were pulled back from Lindsay's mat, and she was gone. The banging continued before the door finally swung open, and Bran entered, stepping on the blankets. Come on, he said, adjusting the strap of his gun on his shoulder, his voice thick, threatening. Where is Lindsay? With the others. Let me see her. Bran had already left the doorway. No time. Follow me. She cursed herself for having let sleep overtake her. She stumbled through the darkened hallway after Bran. What is going on? Bran said nothing but pressed the back of his hand to his forehead as he waited by the door. He sniffed loudly before saying, You coming, or do I have to do this at gunpoint? So much for love and trust. 
A chill raced over Sabrina's body. The pretense was gone. These men had never trusted them. They had simply waited until they had fallen asleep to separate them. She did not have her blaster, and she still had no idea where Lindsay was. Or even if she was still alive. She decided to cooperate until she could learn more, or at least catch Bran unawares. We have to do this before it gets too light, Bran said, stepping through the door onto the deck and cocking his rifle. Sabrina followed obediently, the boards creaking under her feet. Outside, the air was cool. From the chatter of birds and the silence of insects, she could tell Dawn was not far off. She searched the deck for something that might serve her as a weapon, her eyes falling on a clay pot. It was too far. Some of the deck's boards had become warped. She wondered how long it would take her to rip one up and swing it. Too long. Bran would shoot me before I freed it. At the bottom of the stairs, two shovels leaned up against the house. Grab one, Bran said. Now she understood. They were making her dig her own grave. She lifted up the first shovel, testing its balance. The head was spaded and sharp. Bran grabbed the second shovel and told her to walk to the end of the row of houses. The silence of the men the night before made sense now. It was not mourning, but rather the sobriety, the guilt of executioners sharing their food and hospitality with their victims. Grange's entreaties about love were as false as the god they claimed to worship. All occultists had to be liars in order to conceal their beliefs. Her own best friend had lied to her, and she knew she had been a fool to trust these men. Lindsay, if they made you pay with your life, I will end theirs. They reached the last house on the cul-de-sac. It sat on the edge of a ridge where the land dropped precipitously down into a wide, barren valley crisscrossed by dry wadi, the dry ravines winding between buttes of dark rock. The sky was just beginning to lighten in the west with the approaching sun. Bran kept his gun hanging at his side and scanned the sky. Either he was confident in his threat, or he was going along with a facade of trust, assuming she was too naive to understand what was happening. Both possibilities enraged her. She decided that she would kill him. He indicated that they should dig beneath a row of carob trees, where a number of small shrubs had taken root. She obeyed, digging slowly, conserving her energy and making an effort to create an impression of weakness. Bran's impatience was immediate. He began to dig beside her, the hole growing deeper, and the pile beside it higher. He was powerful the shoulders beneath his shirt, wide and rounded, and his arms bulged thicker than Sabrina's thighs. The shovel seemed small in his hands, which were a size too large for even his body. The sun grew closer to the horizon. The blues and blacks of the night gave way to the greens of the garden, the white wall of the house, the earth and red of its shingled roof. Orhem had killed himself. This was different. Sabrina had never killed a man before and she felt like some part of herself would be left in this garden, too. Some part of her would come to an end. She assumed her doubts were just fear. So once Bran turned his back to throw a shovel of dirt onto the pile, before she lost her resolve, she heaved her shovel over her shoulder and swung it at the back of his head. She had braced herself for the impact, so when he ducked his head to catch his breath and the shovel blade passed over him, she flew off balance, careening into the side of the grave, and causing dirt to collapse in a small avalanche on both of them. The tumbling dirt caught Bran's attention, and he turned and processed the shovel that had just missed him, and Sabrina holding the handle. She raised it again to strike, causing more of the pile to collapse. He turned his body towards her, his palms up, making no motion for the gun slung over his shoulder. So this is your story, officer. I didn't come to hurt anyone. But I'll kill you if you hurt Lindsay. Lindsay? I told you, she's with Grange. Digging her own grave? You tell me where. What? No, there with Willsbury, he said, somewhat incredulous. Give me your gun. He slipped off the strap, checked the safety, then tossed it to the other side of the dirt pile. Wills is dead, Bran said. He died last night. Lindsay and Grange did everything they could to save him. Sabrina wanted to believe him. Bran shrugged. Do it, he said. Kill me. I'm ready to die. 
Sabrina shook her head. She was sure this was just another cult speech. But then tears began to stream down Bran's face, tracing clear trails through the yellow dust on his cheeks. Wills was my best friend, he said. He reached out to me after my son died. My wife had left me. All I did was drink illegal brew from distilleries and start fights. I saw enough of your kind in those days. Spent a lot of time in those detention cells in the station. He wiped his face, smearing it with dirt. I was one arrest away from rehabilitation. And you know what? I didn't care. It was Wills who brought me to my first meeting with believers. He did not bother wiping his tears now. In a determined motion, he began gathering the stones and soil that had dropped down into the grave. He easily could have reached out for his rifle, but he didn't. Instead, he kept clawing at the dirt and throwing it over his shoulder. He saved me. This is the last thing I will ever do for him. I don't know you. I don't know what you believe. Your friend says you aren't one of us. And I can tell it's true. He stopped his digging and looked at the shovel poised over her shoulder and snorted a weak laugh. But I'll say this. Be it my last words. If you understand friendship and love, like Grange said, you'll understand why I don't mind sharing this grave with my friend. He turned his face, indifferent to the blow she might deliver and clawed at the earth with his hands, tears falling from his face like raindrops. Sabrina stood still, the shovel a ridiculous weight over her shoulder. She could hear footsteps coming from the direction of the house. Lindsay rounded the corner, followed by Sprocket, Denalis, and Grange, carrying Wills' body, wrapped in a white sheet. She threw the shovel to the side, stepped out of the grave, and ran into the empty street. Lindsay found her on the hillside. The sun was a hand's length from the horizon now, the rocky outcroppings in the valley casting long shadows. She cleared a spot in the sear grass and sat down next to her. I was going to kill him if that's what you were about to ask, Sabrina said, her head resting on her arms folded across her knees. Why? Because I woke up and you weren't there because you didn't tell me you were helping them. You never sleep. I wanted you to get the rest. I thought I was digging my own grave, Lindsay. Bran did not say what happened? He's not a man of many words. I read his... She sighed and put her head in her hands. I read it wrong. I just see the world in a certain way. I see believers in a certain way. Lindsay copied her, dropping her head between her knees, running her hands through her locks and giving them a vigorous shaking. The bells jingled. It was strange to hear something so familiar in a place so alien and forbidden. I'm sorry, Lindsay. A mistake averted. No harm done. Except to their trust of me, and possibly you. They are good men. The men in question were still visible against the white wall of the house, heads bowed, hands held out before them, their palms turned upward as if waiting for something to be handed to them by a deity of generosity. It was like the gesture of surrender Bran had made in the grave. It looked ridiculous. To Sabrina, it epitomized the childish belief in some invisible higher being. She watched Grange remove a small text from his satchel and begin to read. Whatever the ritual, it was illegal. She sneered and looked away. When someone dies, Lindsay said, we don't need law. We don't reach for science. Gadgetry, technology do nothing for us. She tugged on the edge of Sabrina's patrol suit. Ritual keeps the chaos at bay. We need soft words, spoken slowly, the same words over and over again. We need poetry 
We need music. We need songs we know from childhood. We need the thing just beyond the reach of those words that we can never have. If you can never have it, why reach? The reaching makes us better. The reaching makes us empty. Reaching fills us up. We already are empty. Sabrina let out a loud sigh. It was all riddles and doublespeak cult nonsense to her. Grange continued to read while the men listened. Bran knelt down beside the grave, his head bowed so low that he risked tipping into the hole. He covered his eyes, his shoulders shaking. Sprocket placed his hand on his back. Bran said Wills was his best friend, Sabrina said, narrowing her eyes. Said when his life was falling apart, Wills and the Circle, or whatever it is, saved him from himself. It is what faith does. It gives us hope in a hopeless situation. Seems to me Wills took advantage of a vulnerable, grieving man. That is a cynic's view of faith. It's a nightlight, Lindsay, Sabrina said, throwing a rock down the hillside. A nightlight for children afraid of the dark. I don't know why you don't see it. Lindsay said nothing. While they waited for the ritual to end, Sabrina could not erase the image of Bran's face as he had begun to dig the grave with his bare hands. He had been unafraid. Serene. She hated him for that.